Hello, everybody. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Ross Elmsley. Uh, in my role at BCom, I speak to reward, compensation, and now performance management professionals every day. So I hope I can share with you the challenges they face, and most importantly, what organizations are actually doing, because I think some tangible examples is what everyone really wants to know, as we were, as we were just discussing. So I'm going to talk about rewarding moments that matter and how continuous performance management meets continuous total rewards. And to start, let's frame our end goal, which I believe, and I think many of you also believe, is a high performance culture. And the famous quote by Peter Drucker, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And an anecdotal story, cast your mind back to 2015, before anyone knew what a coronavirus was. And Satalia Nadella had just taken over, or just been announced as the new chief executive of Microsoft. And that blog that I screenshotted there argued that he had to change the culture of Microsoft. And there was a lot of issues around the culture, if you remember. So that's 2015. Fast forward to the end of 2016. BCom is hosting an event. Uh, and our keynote speaker was the wonderful John Ingham. And if you don't know him, I highly recommend to follow him. He's a specialist in how uh, HR can be more strategic. We were talking about culture, reward, and our, our partner manager from Microsoft stood up, not a reward guy, not an HR guy, and he said, I can tell you how we are changing the culture at Microsoft. We're firing our top performers. Sorry, what? We're firing some of our top performers. Oh, and of course, he goes to explain why. They were very individualistic. Microsoft wanted to promote team working. They were often, and he said not all of them, but often they were toxic to our new culture. So as we think about culture change and we try and do this and that, sometimes you need big steps, and firing top performers is one of the big ones. <laughs> now, fast forward, that's a screenshot from Glassdoor uh, two days ago. How many big companies have a 97% approval rating of the CEO? Microsoft share price is very high. Of course, everyone's gone down. It's undoubtedly a success story on culture change. So if changing the culture is our objective, how can we do that in the rewards team? How can we support this culture change? So I'll talk a little bit about that. Of course, there's some factors standing in our way. It's worth addressing the market situation. I think every speaker needs to talk about inflation. It's in the contract. Um, we also have a few technology challenges, the ones I hear about every day. And then I'll get into uh, what has been proposed by the way forward. And again, many of you will be familiar with that. And then to finish, I'll share what you can do and what other organizations are doing. So there are external factors at play. You guys know this. I won't, I won't labor the point too much. I'll share a couple of studies which are referenced at the bottom. Uh, and I can post them to my LinkedIn later today if anyone wants to get the, get the links. I think the, the first one is the Mercer study on um, inside employees' minds. 2021, covering my monthly expenses was the ninth biggest concern. 2022, it's the biggest. What a, what a change. And one of those questions was, what's keeping you up at night? So you can't build a high-performance culture if your employees are worried about paying the mortgage and paying the bills. Secondly, um, you also can't build a high-performance culture if your employees are leaving. So the competition for talent is not, it's not just the cost of living, it's the competition for talent. And again, there's another Mercer study that concluded while inflation was X percent, uh, it's the competition for certain skills and talent that's really driving pay up. The remote and dispersed workforce, lots of people have talked about it. I don't need to touch it. You guys know it. Um, but linking performance to pay is obviously very interesting, and the Gartner hype cycle from 2021 noted that many organizations for transparency, for pay fairness, uh, as Justine talked about, are trying to recouple uh, performance and pay as opposed to decoupling it five to six years ago. Uh, so that's, that's quite interesting. Obviously, we have a huge transparency and equity problem. You can't build a high performance culture if your employees believe they're not fairly paid. So, Oh, with all those things together, there's a lot of challenges. That is on top of what you face every day, which is running reward cycles, managing the budget pools, dealing with your stakeholders. That stuff is complex. Which brings us to the internal problem. And it's hard to adapt because pay practices haven't really changed. And this is not my opinion. There's lots of studies on it. I've quoted Josh Burson's one there. 
the annual salary review, benchmarks, pay grades, the annual bonus, it's no longer enough. And this is not a criticism of reward. You've been pretty busy dealing with all the challenges that we have faced. Benefits absolutely have changed. We've seen a great focus on well-being, so credit for that. But I think it's time, and I think and many think it's time, to really change how we pay. Performance management needs to change, is changing, is constantly changing. I wasn't sure what quite, what quite, how to summarize that bullet point. Some organizations are quite far ahead, and I'll, I'll share an example in a minute. Others are, um, well, let's say, not changing as fast as perhaps they, perhaps they should. Um, but, and a topic, a topic, a point on standardization. HR needed to standardize, definitely. It's not a criticism, again. The HR suites do a great job of standardizing. But I hear, I constantly hear, one size fits all. It's not allowing us to innovate. It's not allowing us to change. It's certainly better than what we had before. You know, the comp module of the HRIS is often pretty good and often better than Excel sheets. But more and more we hear it's not enough. And that one size fits all standardization is actually limiting our ability to differentiate, to change our pay, to attract talent, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, looking forward, enough of the problems. I'm a bit of an optimist at heart, so we can ignore the problems and we can think, what are we going to do? And again, there is a better way. And again, I'm referencing um, Josh Burson, but there's, there's many others who've concluded something similar. And again, you guys probably hear this from your stakeholders all the time, that our current annual salary review is it's incremental and always behind. Josh Burson calls it irresistible by design. So building the processes around the employees, making productivity, well-being, energy, skills, and culture core to the business design. And I have a, a great example of that, or a little quote on that, which is we, our employees, we're all employees, we work 225 days a year or so, and then we get our rewards once a year. So, bringing me to the topic of today, how can we make this a bit more continuous? So, what can you do? And I've got a few examples, but first, I'm gonna talk about performance management at a rewards and benefits conference. Why? And you'll, you'll, you'll see in a moment. Firstly, let me define continuous performance management. It's a set of tools that allows employees to exchange feedback anytime, anywhere. Or in other words, it's a continual dialogue of performance conversations. There's a lot of other things as well. It's, it's agile goal setting by managers. It's improved coaching based on that feedback. But if we just focus on the, on the continuous nature for a moment. This is not new. Many of you are probably already doing this today. And as a result of it not being new, it's well studied. So let's have a look at some of those studies. More productivity from our employees, more likely to outperform our peers, greater performance, increased frequency, increases engagement. Um, increased engagement results in increased discretionary effort, and increased discretionary effort again. Aren't those the, reward, aren't those the outcomes that reward is trying to focus on? Increased employee engagement, yes. Driving performance, yes. So here is a way that we can deliver reward outcomes without reward or with reward. Again, why is it a separate department? That's a different, different uh, topic entirely. So if continuous performance management is a good idea, and I believe it is, and again, some people, many people agree, I hope, the role of rewards becomes how can we reinforce or underpin or or help create a high performance culture based on feedback. I said I'd provide some tangible examples. Um, Carol Hoffman is the head of performance at Standard Bank. So if you don't know Standard Bank, they're Africa's biggest lender, uh, 56,000 employees. So they use BCom for continuous performance management. And you can see the quote there, and there's a couple of key points. It's enable our leaders so continuous performance management is a line leader-led strategy. It's about em empowering your managers to be better managers. We wanted to create the capability in our people to grow within the organization because your employees are one of your greatest assets. If you can get an extra two, three, or even 20% out of them, that's a massive impact. 
and to take long strides toward delivering our people promise. So they have a people promise, I'm sure many of you do. It includes fairness, transparency, giving them opportunity. So continuous performance management helps them do that. And again, a, a, little, a little quote. Um, they had eight weeks to deploy, so that's about 40 working days, and ignoring if the fact we worked in the weekend a little bit. Uh, and we went live on time. And within one week, 100,000 goals have been created in the system. So the employers, they did a great job of communication. Um, the, sorry, not the employees. The, the managers really adopted the system for, for goal setting. Once the goals are in, you have that continuous feedback conversation. So if you're running a continuous reward program and you have all the problems that I and all the other speakers have talked about, how can you create a continuous reward strategy to reinforce that and underpin it. And I can't talk too much about our customers. If I can share the name, I can, because of course we always have a, a confidentiality agreement. Um, so what are some people doing? First and foremost, it's not rocket science, empower your managers to reward more frequently. So if they're giving feedback, or if they see excellent performance, or someone completes a goal, you can give them a reward. But I hear you say, where does the budget come from? Well, the budget comes from the individual part of the bonus plan. Take it out of the annual bonus plan and put it into continuous performance. That's an important distinction. It's not a recognition program. It's not a cherry on the top, 100 quid here, 100 quid there. It's not a below the line recognition program. It's the individual part of their bonus based on their feedback and their completion of the goals in the system. So it's a quite a shift. And that money is available. Of course, it's a budget. We don't have unlimited money. No one does. Each manager has a budget, again. So firstly, enable your managers to reward more frequently. Uh, a second example is one of our clients I spoke to recently is going to double the number of pay reviews they do. So they do annual reviews in most countries, six monthly reviews in Turkey, Argentina, uh, one other high inflation that I can't remember now. Uh, so they're going to double. They're going to go quarterly in the high inflation and every six months in all the other countries. So quite a challenge for the reward team. Um, but again, all, change is difficult, as you all know, but that's something you can do. Um, more team-based rewards. So again, this is not new. Um, and my example is Daimler. So Daimler, in 2017, launched a culture change from a stuffy German car company. Stuffy is maybe not their word. I think they used the word, we need to freshen up our culture. So by definition, it was, it was stuffy. Um, from a car company to a technology company. 2017, Google was working on a car, still is, by the way. Apple was working on a car, isn't. Uh, the Tesla share price was about $20. It went up to 400, it's back down to 190 or so. So anyway, they were right, is my nutshell. They needed to change their culture and they needed to attract tech talent to build the cars that, that um, to the keynote speaker this morning, um, is electrifying our, um, our, our transition. So culture change, to do that culture change, they got rid of almost all their individual rewards and they introduced a lot of team-based rewards. Why? Because they wanted to create cross-functional teams to address the problems that they needed to address. And they didn't want individual rewards to get in the way of that. Now again, there's a whole, there's a case study behind that on how do you implement um, team-based rewards in a matrix organization, in a fast-changing organization. Um, so that's Daimler. The fourth example is you could do what Josh Burson and uh, the reference at the bottom of the slide is um, Tamara Chandler, which is throw out your pay structures and completely redesign them. So the ambitious and the brave among you, uh, you may already be doing it, but the, you know, that is what some spe other speakers have mentioned. You pay based on the market, so you benchmark your salaries, but you don't pay for years of tenure, you don't pay for um, growth, uh, sorry, you do pay for growth and you pay for skills. So if the employee acquires a skill, they can be paid for it. Uh, and part of that framework that I've referenced there is more frequent bonuses as well. A couple of other examples, excuse me, is you can use the feedback 
as, uh, as a gateway. And what I mean by that is eligibility for your populations. So don't decide who's eligible for LTI or who's eligible for a promotion based on length of service or based on grade. Why does grade six become eligible for LTI? Why not use the feedback data? Because that will help you identify who's living our behaviors, who are our top performers, who are the people that are really showing leadership. So you can use continuous performance feedback as a gateway to reward or as a criteria in your populations for eligibility. So that's six examples of what companies are doing or are planning to do in the near term. One last point is we're business people. What we do has to deliver return on investment. So a couple of examples on how you can go to your organizations and uh, demonstrate ROI. First, time saved is money saved. Many of you will have separate performance and reward processes with thousands of managers across the world. That's a big time, uh, big time waste for managers. So one of our prospects, not a customer yet, but hopefully soon, uh, is a fast-moving consumer goods company. Their performance management is in November or December, and their reward is in January and February. Two different processes, two different systems, a huge amount of work for all their managers. They want to put that into one, and so the manager will award the, summarize all the feedback into a performance rating, and the performance rating drives the pay. There will be some discretion, maybe a little bit, but very formulaic. Now that's them, it's not right for everybody, that's them. The point is, how fast for the managers? How fast for the managers? It's a massive time saving for their, for their managers. Um, the improve admin processes is the same example, but the admin team has two different processes to prepare, to manage, to monitor, to report on, and they want to put that all in one place, in one system. Uh, which brings me to consolidate uh, without a one-size-fits-all approach. Uh, so one of our clients is Greystone. Greystone is American. Uh, they do real estate financing, 1,500 employees, about 80 billion in loans uh, on real estate. So they're consolidating their performance and reward in one system um, so that they can adapt, so that they can attract talent, um, and so that they can really put it all in this one package. Several of the speakers have spoken about a single source of the truth. If you have the performance and the reward in one system, it becomes a natural place for reporting and analytics. Uh, Kunal and Nagel, uh, for those of you in the transport and logistics business, not as well known as DHL and the others, but 78,000 employees. A big part of their ROI was how, um, how are our bonus plans and our variable plans driving performance? And they confessed we had no visibility. None. So their ROI was based on creating plans, performance plans, that we know are driving performance, that we have visibility into, that we can control, and of course we can, we can change if we need to. And then the very last example is beyond cost savings. In this climate with the potential recession, I think you're going to have to demonstrate cost savings. But what about employees, increased employee engagement? I shared some research earlier. Uh, but, but a client of ours, I can't share the name, I'm sorry, because it's in financial services. Uh, South American, 85 million customers. South America has a massive population. Um, they deployed continuous performance management, and three months later they did a culture check. There was a 10% increase in their um, internal employee culture score. I've talked to organizations that are striving for a 2% increase, and many of you are probably seeing a decrease at the moment. So a nice, tangible example of, of, how, of how the continuous performance, underpinned by continuous rewards, can help.